It is a joy to hear. <laughs> we have a nice creative group. Did you hear that poem, Ajahn Gamali? Yes, I said it well enough, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Yeah. So let's start as a poem. And uh, so we are looking at a set of teachings that is often called the six recollections. Yeah, they are grouped together in the suttas and they are uh, grouped also in this particular sutta in the Ankutra 6 is number 10. Uh, the first of these recollections is the recollection of the Buddha, the Buddha's qualities and who he is. And it's, these things can be quite creative and it's really up to the individual how they want to do these uh, kind of recollections. But it is good to found and base it on the ideas presented by the Buddha himself, uh, because then you have some guidance in how to do these things. Uh, and uh, the second one then is the recollection of the Dhamma, the teachings. So, yeah, so we'll go on to the second one there. Uh, so, uh, furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the teaching here. Yeah? The teaching, as follows, the teaching is well explained by the Buddha, uh, visible in this very life, immediately effective, inviting inspection relevant uh, so that sensible people can know it for themselves so when a noble disciple recollects the dhamma their mind is not full is free of greed or desire ill will and confusion uh, yeah and then it goes through the whole sequence just like we did last time uh, uh, going through the various states of mind up to samadhi and then it says at the end this is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are untroubled, who enter the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of the Dhamma. So this is the, um, uh, the teachings, and obviously this is very closely related to the first one, the Buddha, because this is like the consequence of being a Buddha, when you are a Buddha, the, this, these teachings are, in a sense, the essence of that awakening experience. Yeah? They are the expression of that awakening experience. So, so for that reason, they are obviously very interesting. And what is um, fascinating, though, is that at the beginning, when the Buddha started out and he started to teach, uh, he wasn't sure if it was going to be effective. He didn't know yeah, whether well, this is going to work out or not. Uh, and uh, remember when in, in the very first teaching of the Buddha, the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, the setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, he gives the Four Noble Truths, and he teaches them in detail. And, and then at the end, uh, Venerable Anya Kondanya, one of the first five disciples, uh, he's actually only called Kondanya at that point, uh, he exclaims, or he says something that, you know, I, or he doesn't actually say anything. It's the Buddha that does the exclamation. Uh, yeah, and he's the Buddha. Uh, and that Kondanya sees the Dhamma, he becomes a stream and all of that. And then the Buddha realizes that. And the Buddha exclaims, uh, Kondanya knows, Anya Sivatabo Kondanyo. Uh, Kondanya understands, Kondanya understands. Yeah, and it's like an exclamation of surprise almost from the Buddha because he didn't know whether his Dhamma was going to be all that effective. What he knew was that the Dhamma was very profound and very hard to see. It's not going to be very accessible by people yeah, in general, because most people have quite dull faculties, especially the faculties on the spiritual path. And so he had doubts. And we know that from the way it is expressed in the uh, noble search where the Buddha de uh, decides whether he's going to teach or not, we know that he's kind of doubtful whether it's worthwhile teaching. Yeah? So then when it finally comes, it's like he's surprised. Uh, and then later on, uh, as he continues teaching, he calls this the miracle of instruction. Maybe miracle is not such a good word because it has kind of Christian overtones, but uh, the, the wonder or the marvel of instruction. Yeah? Uh, whereby you instruct somebody, you just use words to explain something which is largely beyond words. Yeah, it is very hard to express things that are so profound. And the Buddha calls it the, the miracle or the marvel of instruction later on. 
And uh, in certain suttas, like the uh, Kibanda Sutta in the Diga Nikaya number 11, he compares the various kinds of marvels and he talks about the marvels of psychic powers and the marvels of mind reading. Uh, and it says the, the marvel that beats them all is the marvel of instruction. That is the real marvel. All the other marvels are, are like uh, low, they are like not really interesting. Yeah. Someone can fly through the air, yeah, whatever, you know, no, no big deal. <laughs> Someone can walk on the water, okay, fine, you know, you, you have fun with that. But actually, the real miracle, what really matters uh, is the miracle of instruction, because that is what gives real happiness. That is what destroys suffering. That is what has a real goal and aim and purpose. The other miracles, okay, they might be interesting, yeah, but uh, there's nothing much more to it. In fact, the Buddha is very skeptical of these so-called marvels and miracles. And he specifically says about them that he is repelled by these miracles. So why? Because they lead those people who already have faith and confidence, they will say, yay, look at what these monks can do, what these, uh, anyone can do, yeah, with enough powers. And they will kind of rejoice in that. But those people who are skeptical will say, yeah, yeah, sure, it's just a trick, yeah, it's some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of smart magician that, yeah. Uh, who's just doing a trick or, or whatever. So uh, these are, the Buddha himself is not really impressed by these things, which is kind of fascinating, yeah? uh, because sometimes we talk too much about such things. Uh. So this is the Dhamma, yeah? this is the Dhamma that has this uh, marvelous outcome, this ability to turn the world upside down for people. Uh. And the qualities of the Dhamma are then those qualities that aren't listed here. And then one of the first things you will see is that the Buddha says that the Dhamma is well explained. Yeah? Uh, the Pali is svakato, yeah? suakato. Yeah? And uh, uh, the idea here, and this is kind of sort of expounded upon all the places in the suttas, uh, the idea is that the teaching of the Buddha, as I mentioned before, is complete. Uh, there's nothing lacking, nor is there anything superfluous. Uh, and the way it is phrased, it is phrased with care. Yeah, it is the Buddha, and you can see that the way the consistency through the suttas is actually astonishing how it all fits together in such a beautiful way. He has taken obviously a lot of trouble to get this going, put this on a good footing at the very beginning. Yeah? And in this sense, the Dhamma in the suttas is far more clear than any other Dhamma teachings you can ever get. I'm always surprised how people prefer contemporary Dhamma teaching to the teachings of the suttas and how they prefer this teacher to that teacher, because uh, sometimes you do get teachers who are really charismatic, yeah, and they are very, they have an ability to, to talk and ability to have presence on the stage and you see them and you, you feel really kind of, you feel alive in their presence and it's funny and it's entertaining and there's some good Dhamma points as well. And, Sure, but if you start to analyze what they're actually saying, if you listen carefully to the content, rather than just being taken away or taken, taken, taken away by the charisma of the person, then to me, it is very obvious that the content of almost any contemporary teacher, in fact, not almost any, any contemporary teacher, or indeed any teacher throughout Buddhist history, for that matter, is pales in significance to the Buddha. Because you start looking at what they're saying and you wonder, what do they actually mean by that? Uh, they use words that seem really nice, they're deathless. Well, actually, what do they mean by the deathless when they use this word? Uh, what do they mean by even jhana when they use this word? And you listen carefully and you start to see the uh, consistency, the uh, uh, overall coherence of the argument is not the same as what you find the suit in the suttas. Uh, if you want to have precision about the Buddhist teachings, uh, if you really want to know what Buddhism is about, it's the suttas that you find that. The teaching is svakato, it really is well proclaimed in, 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 in basically almost any way you would like to look at it. And um, you may wonder, and this is a very important question sometimes, and I can maybe touch on this very briefly here. Uh, you may wonder, well, are these teachings, how reliable are they? It's been two and a half thousand years since the Buddha passed away. How do we know that we have that word of the Buddha? And uh, the answer is that we can know that to a fairly uh, large extent through comparative studies, because it so happens that these teachings were spread out to uh, various parts of Central Asia, to various countries and different languages. And many of these 
uh, translations of the sutra, sutras in different languages and different areas still exist in the present day. So you can do comparative study. You can compare the sutras uh, and uh, lineages, lineages of schools that separated maybe 2,300 years ago uh, with independent sutras. And you compare them and the, met the essential message. Uh, yeah, the, the core teachings is almost the same in all of this, uh, all of these various schools. Uh, so there's no doubt that we have the Dhamma of the Buddha. Yes, every detail is not going to be exactly the same, but the message, the main message, the main structure is the Four Noble Truths, dependent on origination, dependent liberation, the 37 uh, age to awakening, all of that is, uh, is uh, identical across this schools. So the Dhamma is still there. We're still in touch with the teaching of the Buddha. We haven't lost uh, the essence of these teachings. And that teaching is svakato. It is well proclaimed. If you want to understand Dhamma, that is where you should go. Uh, and um, what the Buddha says next, it says that uh, these teachings are visible in this very life, sanbhittiko, immediately effective, uh, yeah, akaliko, nothing to do with time, kala is time. And so both of these point to this important aspect of the Dhamma, which is very different from the vast majority of religions that you find in the human realm. And that is that these teachings can be experienced in the here and now, yeah? They are experiential in this life. You don't have to wait till after you passed away to verify these things. They are available now both in the short term, in terms of little increments of, you know, of uh, moving forwards on the path, uh, and also in terms of the big picture, uh, whereby you see the teachings fully. Uh, and one of the things that makes the Buddhist teachings quite unique, again, in the, uh, the history of the world. Uh, um, inviting inspection, yeah, this ehi uh, pasiko, uh, come and see, yeah, come and see for yourself. Uh, and uh, so this is a similar kind of idea again that you you see as you practice and you, uh, you you get something out and you see whether the teachings actually work in your life uh, relevant or applicable or worthy of practice yeah the next one opanaiko these teachings are worthy of practice why because they give real results yeah they have they have some they're actually going somewhere they have a real aim they have a real purpose it is not just a temporary thing or a partial thing but a full purpose of the spiritual path with a precise and very clear endpoint to it and uh, uh, so and it is for uh, wise people to know for themselves there were sensible people can know these things for themselves so, so you have to be sensible, that's the downside. If you're not sensible, then you have a problem. But, uh, and it's hard to know how sensible one is or how wise one is, of course. But uh, the very fact that you are here, the very fact that someone is interested in this path uh, means that there is a lot of sense there already. You're already on the right track. You have understood something, yeah? So you just carry on and then you start uncovering it. Uh, and then uh, gradually you uh, kind of, uh, you can always, you will always become more sensible and more wise by practicing this path. Uh, this is the good thing about these uh, teachings. Uh, so this is the Dhamma for you, this beautiful teaching that takes you from darkness to light, from suffering to happiness, from ignorance to wisdom. Uh, and this beautiful teaching that um, uh, is world transcending, that turns the world upside down for you, what you thought was happiness turns out to be suffering, and what you thought was suffering turns out to be happiness, and what you thought was a permanent essence of yourself turns out to be impermanent and problematic, and it's this uh, revolution in consciousness and a revolution that is very, very positive, yeah, which this teaching promises. So this is the, uh, the, the kind of the cause for the, uh, this is the foundation cause for the result, you know, the uh, Dhamma and the Atta, the Atta being the purpose of this practice, where what is aiming at, and the Dhamma being like the cause uh, for us to get to that result. Uh, so, um, going a little bit faster now, let's go on to the, uh, the next one, and this is the uh, recollection of the Sangha. Uh, uh, furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the Sangha. 
The Sangha of the Buddha's disciples is practicing the way that is good. It is direct, methodical, and proper. It consists of four pairs, the eight individuals. This is the Sangha of the Buddha's disciple that is worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods. Well, that's the same worthy of offerings. <coughs> worthy of hospitality, worthy of religious donation, worthy of greetings with joint palms, and is the supreme field of merit for the world. When a noble disciple recollects the Sangha, their mind is uh, freed of uh, desire, ill will, and confusion, etc., etc. And then you build up the joy, you build up the happiness, you take it to Samadhi, and then you are called a noble disciple who lives in balance uh, among people who are unbalanced, who lives are troubled among people who are troubled, uh, that enter the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of the Sangha. So um, uh, this is uh, uh, the Sangha. You notice here this uh, uh, four, pa four pairs, the eight individuals. These are called the noble ones in Buddhism. These are the people who have basically seen the Dhamma yeah, or are very close to seeing it anyway. Uh, and these are noble ones. And the reason why they are the Sangha and the noble ones, this is the noble Sangha, is because they understand these teachings. They are independent of the Buddha, independent of the Dhamma, and they have the ability themselves to teach the world. Yeah? So meeting noble ones is always the kind of the, um, that, that's what you meet, the real Sangha in Buddhism. And uh, it is said here, the way they are explained, they are explained as practicing uh, the good way, yeah? Supatipanno, the direct way. This is, in other words, the path which goes directly to the goal. Ujjo, direct, yeah? straight way, if you like. Yeah? Good here could mean many things, but it could mean something like the happy way. Yeah? Or these teachings actually are happy both in terms of end goal, but also in terms of what you have as you practice them. Uh, methodical, this is the Nyaya Patipano, and this is interesting. Methodical here actually relates to dependent origination. Now, dependent origination has two kind of um, sides to it. One is the side of originating, how suffering arises from ignorance. And the other one is the cessation sequence. I didn't show you that because we weren't going to, going to go into dependent origination in great detail, but the cessation sequence is the inverse of the origination sequence. Take away ignorance and delusion, and it ends in uh, the end of suffering. Yeah? So it is that cessation sequence that the areas are practicing, the cessation of uh, the cessation sequence of dependent origination. Uh, they're moving towards the ending of all of this. Yeah? That is the methodical way or the method that they're practicing. Uh, and the last one, the proper way, samichi, the, uh, the appropriate way, perhaps as well. Yeah? The way, again, the, these are almost like uh, synonyms here, and some of these, and proper, direct, good, is kind of closely related to each other, but the appropriate way, yeah, that which leads to the results again, uh, consists of four pairs uh, of eight individuals. And because they have seen the Dhamma, it means that they are this part of the supreme teachers of the world. And that's why, because they are the supreme teachers, that is why they are said to be worthy of offerings. Uh, I have no idea why he has dedicated to the gods there, but. <laughs> But I think it has something to do with the Pali word. It usually has a reference of dedicating offerings to the gods. But uh, it's a little bit strange to have it here too. But anyway, worthy of hospitality, worthy of religious donation, worthy of Anjali, joint palms. The idea is that when someone has access you know, to these teachings, uh, they have a direct experiential understanding of the highest happiness. They have the ability to teach that to others. And they are like the teacher who can bestow you with the highest kind of wisdom, the highest kind of, of anything, really. And uh, so if we are going to honor ordinary teachers in the world, well, these teachers who can give you something far more are worthy of even more honor and even more of these positive qualities, and etc., etc. This is what this is about, uh, yeah? And um, they are then the, 
it says here they are the supreme field of merit for the world yeah this uh, this this is where offerings go a long way when you offer to such people uh, really offerings should often go to groups like the sangha is probably a preferable thing but uh, if you're going to offer to individuals then uh, this is said to be the supreme field of merit in the world uh, and the reason, of course, is because these beings, they have the ability to spread happiness far and wide, to eliminate delusions. So by supporting beings like this, you are supporting the spread of happiness, wisdom, and understanding in the world. And that's why the, the merit is so uh, special for supporting beings like this. So who are these people that you uh, see, you know, that you, that you read about here? And it's very hard to pinpoint that and i'm not going to tell you who i think might be the noble ones in this world because it's just going to be silly if you if i do that and uh, you have to make up that mind yourself how do you know and you can never really know for sure but you can have some idea of who is not a noble one yeah that, that, that is all, always possible but the general principles of who are the noble ones are fairly straightforward i mentioned those principles the other day yeah they are very generous, they are kind, the defilement, very little defilements or no defilements if they are areas, yeah, they are peaceful, they sometimes they say things that are really con contrary to how people, ordinary people think about things, and that's kind of one of the um, traits as well and sometimes. Uh, so you just look for those good qualities, uh, and the more of those you see in a person, the more likely they are to be further along the path. But in the end, it is very hard to know. Yeah, and in the end, I wouldn't recommend you to judge too much about too much about these things, because sometimes you just end up getting it wrong. And at the same time, it is important to judge when someone is not a noble one and not to be afraid of acknowledging that some people have defilements that are not really consistent with being a noble person. It is too much fear in the Buddhist world sometimes, and maybe not so much in the, some, sometimes you find this in more maybe in traditional Buddhist countries where they have a long tradition of these things, and they sometimes you hear things like, oh, you can't criticize that person or that monk because they're arahant. That is getting it the wrong way around. Yeah, you can't criticize because they're arahant. Actually, first of all, you look at the conduct, then you decide whether they're arahant. You don't start off assuming they're arahant, and then you can't criticize them. There's no other way around it. And if they have a dubious conduct, well, then it's okay to have doubts. You don't have to have an absolute judgment, but it's okay to have doubts. This is an important part of, you know, of being reasonable about things. Yeah? It doesn't mean you have to denounce the person or anything like that, but it's okay to have doubts. And that is the Buddha specifically says yeah, in the suttas that to dispraise those worthy of criticism, that is what you should be doing yeah it quite it says that in a number of places that is good karma that is the right way of doing it if you praise somebody worthy of criticism actually it's bad because you are deluding people you're confusing the world and that is what we see quite a lot of in buddhist circles in the same way of course you know when it comes to people who really are noble of course we should praise them and we shouldn't you know and of course it is bad to criticize someone who really is noble uh, at least you know, for, you know, in the wrong way. Yeah, I criticize them for being lesser or whatever when they really are noble people. So that is an important part of it as well. So we shouldn't we shouldn't be fearful. We shouldn't just go with kind of received opinion in the world. We should always remember that the majority of people in the world don't really understand. If the majority of people in the world understood, everyone would be supremely happy. Yeah, the fact that we are all mired in suffering means that the majority of people do not understand it. So we should not be afraid of standing our own ground and looking at things differently and taking our own perspective. Yeah, this is very, uh, really, really important. And uh, when, you, when you do that, then you are far safer than you otherwise are. Sometimes people say, oh, but I'm deluded, yeah, and I, you know, I can't trust my own judgment. Well, you only have your own judgment. There is nothing else, yeah. If you say that I'm deluded, so I need to trust, listen to, to other people, well, who you listen to, you are going to be the judge of that. Yeah? So you still ultimately have to fall back on your own judgment. Yeah? So uh, that is uh, 
how this is the noble disciples. Yeah? There are some really astonishing examples of these uh, people in the world who are often taken to be uh, noble ones. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, one of the very famous monks in Sri Lanka who passed away a few years ago. He, um, uh, he was one of these monks who started his life in Sri Lanka. He came from Germany originally and came there, I think, between the two world wars to Sri Lanka. And then he stayed in one monastery for a few years and just studying the suttas, learning the suttas by heart, yeah? So he could carry the Dhamma with him because he didn't have books or anything like that. And then he set off, and he set off by foot, yeah? He didn't have any sandals, nothing like that. He had his three robes, he had a, his bowl, yeah? And then he had maybe three or four requisites, like a needle and, and something like that. And that was all he had. He wandered around Sri Lanka. And he wandered around the island of Sri Lanka for something like 30 years. Yes, 30 years of wandering around. Maybe, maybe it was even more. I'm not sure now how long it was. And uh, just wandering and wandering and wandering. And hey, he became revered as one of the great uh, uh, Aryas, noble people of Sri Lanka. He had almost nothing, always kind of just traveling around and then settling down for a while in a good place to meditate and then carrying on, moving on again. And of course, what is so powerful about that is that you are so removed from the ordinary pleasures of the world. Yeah, you have nothing. You certainly don't have any relationships. Yeah? You don't have any entertainment. The, even the food you have is just really, really basic. Yeah? Simple rice and things. And there is very, very few pleasures in life. And you start to realize that here is someone who is able to be happy with so little pleasures in life, they're obviously getting their pleasure from something else. And he was, was a, uh, considered a meditation master, and he would obviously teach very profound meditation. And he was very popular with Ajahn Brahm because he would say that, you know, you have to have really deep samadhi to become a noble one. So Ajahn Brahm always praised this particular monk as, a, as an exceptional example of a good Dharma practitioner here. And this is really inspiring. Yeah? You get this feeling of someone who knows something more profound, have access to a different kind of reality. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to live like that. And there are examples like, like that, not just among the monks. There are some very inspiring nuns in the world as well. Like Ayakema was a very inspiring nun, who obviously had very good meditation. And uh, there are uh, many others as well, and uh, I am because I'm a monk. I'm less well versed in the nuns' world than in, in the monks' world, uh, but uh, there are others as well. And also, there are some very inspiring lay people in this world. Uh, I know some lay people who are really absolutely awesome, and they are far more awesome than than some of the monks I know. Yeah, and they are really exceptional, living by themselves, far away somewhere is living pretty much off the joy of their meditation practice, yeah, living really, really simple lives. Uh, I know a lady who lives on a far away on a property right here in Australia, and uh, she's the kind of person who, if there is anyone in this world who is a lay person, who is a noble one, she would be one of those. She's just a really remarkable person. Uh, yeah, and uh, I don't want to say too much because I don't think these people want to be known by anyone, but uh, there are people out there who are really extraordinary. Uh, and sometimes just thinking about that, knowing that the Dhamma is still alive in the world, knowing that we have Kalyana Mittas for practicing well, uh, people who have our best interest at heart when we listen to their teachings, uh, we can open up and we can take it on board because we know these are people who are coming from purity, coming from goodness, doing the right thing. What an amazing thing it is to have these kind of kalanamitas in the world. What a wonderful thing that is. Reflect on that, yeah? That kind of support, which is so essential for being able to live the spiritual life. And it lifts you up. And then this process starts, yeah? You start to feel a bit of joy. You bring it in with your meditation and you allow this whole thing to take off. It becomes a... Uh, sangha Nusati, recollection of the Sangha, re recollection of the Kalyana Mittas in your life. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own ethical conduct, which is unbroken, impeccable, spotless, and unmarred, liberating, praised by sensible people, not mistaken. 
not grasped, I would say, uh, and leading to stillness. When a noble disciple recollects the ethical conduct, the mind again is free of the desire, ill will, and confusion. And then all the happiness comes and the samadhi arises, and then this is called a noble disciple who lives in balance, balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled, that enter the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of ethics. <coughs> So this is the re recollection of, of Sila, the Sila Nusati. And um, one of the things that you will have not, that we noticed before is uh, how often in the suttas, the sequence of uh, uh, the meditation, here we're talking about all, the whole sequence of meditation before, it begins with being established on Sila. Yeah? Sila is the foundation. And one of the reasons that Sila is the foundation is this, because it gives rise automatically to a sense of feeling good about oneself, yeah, having a sense of joy. Yeah? So the, you will notice here there are some important qualifications of this particular sila. It has to be ideally that this, remember, this is the sila of the noble people. So we're trying to approach that as well as much as we can. Unbroken has to be impeccable, spotless, and unmarred. So these are all synonyms, that meaning that we should perfect it as much as we can, and the more perfected our sila is, also in terms of mental sila, also in terms of developing the positive qualities of metta and compassion and kindness. Yeah? When all of this comes together, the more perfect it is, the more power it is going to have to be an engine in our practice. Yeah? It's like uh, firing up our practice with some uh, nuclear uh, uranium material. So we really, the mind becomes a uh, you know, powerful uh, nuclear reactor of uh, joy and happiness and all of these kind of things. So you may think I'm making up some funny things, but this is actually something Ajahn Brahm told me a long time ago, that yeah, when you are doing really, really well, your meditation is powerful, you become like a nuclear reactor. And I never forgot that because it was such a striking idea to be like a nuclear reactor. So, um, <laughs> so, and, and so it's very powerful. It's liberating, yeah. It's a, a buddhism. Uh, so it, it's, a, a, you know, it's kind of funny. People feel constrained by sila, but sila does not constrain you. It liberates you from the troubles of the mind. Uh, it is praised by sensible people, yeah. So you, we can choose whether we want to be praised by the sensible people or we want to be praised by dodgy characters. Uh, and I would say, let's be praised by sensible people rather than dodgy, by shady characters. Uh, not mistaken, not grasped. This just means that as you become a noble one, you no longer grasp the sila. You don't have to because it, it has now become part of you. And it leads to immersion. It leads to samadhi. It leads to stillness, the last one there. And uh, you can see how this, um, this kind of... Um, refrain or this kind of um, idea recurs in the suttas again and again in different ways. And this is what I mean by the integrity of the suttas, how it all holds together so beautifully. Yeah. Here we have the idea that uh, sila is the foundation for samadhi. Previously, we, we saw that sila is the foundation for satipatthana practice, for meditation practice. Yeah? And uh, before that, we saw that sila is the foundation for this whole sequence of factors that lead to samadhi. Yeah? So this comes in different guises, in different places in the suttas, the same basic idea, sila being what leads to these things. And this is where the problem of uh, purity of mind really lies. And this is kind of the, what we need to look at if we want to have success in our meditation practice. So, so these are the things, yeah? And once we get the sila together, and even if you only get it together partially, how do we use that in our meditation practice to give rise to joy? And very often it is almost automatic. The more pure your sila is, the more automatic it is going to be. You sit back, you watch your breath, or you just chill, you know, you're kind of enjoying yourself. And, and then suddenly you just start to feel this feeling, which is very positive, yeah, this kind of joy or gladness bubbling up inside because you know that you are living well, you know you're doing the right thing. Yeah. So it's automatic, you don't really have to do very much. Often this is a sequence that just works on its own. Sometimes 
you had to maybe nudge the mind a little bit because maybe you are in a bit of a you know, the mood may, may not be super duper great or you know something may have happened uh, and you need to change your attitude a little bit uh, and then remember when you then recall this it's a very gentle thing it is not something that you use a lot of willpower to do it is more like just gen very gently guiding your mind in that direction uh, reminding yourself that you have lived well yeah you have developed this thought before so all you need is a very gentle reminder yeah i'm keeping the five precepts for years yeah i've been keeping the eight precepts on retreat uh, i'm keeping even more precepts if you're a monastic yeah? and wow what a wonderful thing that is i've been giving a gift to the world uh, giving the gift of safety yeah? of freedom from all kind of psychological anguish and anxieties that people have because they live in a world which sometimes is dangerous well i have given people that safety in their life uh, given a gift to animals by treating them well as well uh, wow what a wonderful thing that is uh, uh, or just a, a general sense of you know your good character your metta meditation or whatever it might be uh, so very gentle knowledge of the mind uh, in the process of meditation sometimes uh, just to kind of boost the feeling a little bit uh, feeling a little bit lighter, a little bit brighter. Yeah? And then you carry on with the meditation again, yeah? Leaving that feeling at the back of your mind and then moving on in the meditation practice. Yeah? And uh, so, uh, but very often it is just really automatic. It happens almost by itself, by default, because you know that you have been living in the right way. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, I, let's carry on because time is a little bit shorter, but I think we get the essence of these practices. And furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their generosity. Yeah, yeah. I am so fortunate, so very fortunate. <laughs> Among people full of the stain of stinginess, I live at home rid of stinginess, freely generous, open-handed, loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and to share. When a noble disciple recollects their own generosity, their mind is not full, again, is free of the desire, ill will and confusion. And all the happiness has come and then from the happiness as you develop the samadhi and then you're called again a disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced who live untroubled among people who are troubled they have entered the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of generosity here so um, i can see again it's a very high standard here of generosity yeah freely generous and loving to let go we yeah? are loving to kind of give out to others and of course the reason why you love it is because it feels good yeah it feels so nice the kind of happiness you get from the giving is far greater than the happiness that you get from having these things yeah letting go is a far superior feeling to having them so the world gets it wrong the world gets it upside down in the world we want to accumulate and build up our possessions when actually the giving up of those possessions is far better i remember many years ago there was a monk who told me that his his mother had earned some in had, had got some enormous um her husband had died or something and she inherited this vast amount of money and i i said something i can't remember what i said i said oh yeah that's that's cool yeah and uh, and he said ah not really you know my mother doesn't really care for money yeah. And I said that, well, it's great to have money. You can give it away. <laughs> yeah, if you have all that money and you don't care for it, well, even better, yeah, because it means that you can give it away and the amount of joy and happiness you get from that is marvelous. So we should never look down upon money yeah, because we can give it away. Yeah, so that's kind of one of the great things about it. Of course, we should enjoy it ourselves as well. We have to have some amount of money to be able to survive, but, yeah. But if we have a bit too much, we can give it away instead of hoarding it. And this is what this is about. So the high standard here, yeah, loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and to share. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this is uh, the idea in uh, Buddhism is that uh, if you really want to go to very deep states of meditation you have to have this kind of attitude in your mind where you just give it to the whole world yeah 
It's like you have this open heartedness and you just want to share everything that you own. You want to give it out. It's this beautiful state of mind. And you know when you have it that this is a spiritual state of mind. It's just so obvious, yeah, because of this. Uh, it feels really, feels very, very good. And you know that it's good for you and for others. Uh, there's something very positive about this, very wholesome about this kind of state. Uh, and that is a state that leads to samadhi, that enables these things to happen. Also, it enables the state of uh, becoming an area to happen as well. Uh, so uh, learning to be generous uh, and doing this in the right way is a very important uh, practice to do. And also in your meditation practice. And again, the way to do this in meditation is uh, just to, again, just to sit back yeah, and uh, ask yourself a memory. Do I have a memory of a time when I did something really nice when I, uh, I gave something away or I offered myself, you know, or did some service for somebody you know, and just allow that memory to kind of percolate through your mind, of that, of that memory, that idea, and then something will arise, a yeah, memory when you felt really generous and you really wanted to share it with the whole world and you bring that back, that memory, yeah. you use past experiences in this way, you bring that back and then you feel, sometimes you can feel that same joy now that you felt then when you did that. Uh, or it can be more like a general idea of generosity, knowing that you are a generous person without a specific act. Yeah? Again, it's really about whatever works there for people. Uh, using that as part of your meditation practice. So. Let's come to the last one of these uh, six recollections. Uh, and uh, this is a more unusual recollection, yeah, I, and but it's, it's nevertheless it's interesting. It comes last on this list, which probably means that it is the least important one, or the least powerful one, perhaps. However, however you want to look at it. Um, but uh, this is how it goes. Uh, yeah. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the deities. Uh, there are the gods of the four great kings, the gods of the 33, the gods of Yama, the joyful gods, the gods who love to create, the gods who control the creations of others, the gods of Brahma's host, and gods even higher than these. When those deities passed away from here, they were reborn there because of their faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom. I too have the same kind of faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom. When a noble disciple recollects the faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom of both themselves and the deities, their mind is not, again, is freed from desire, ill will, and confusion. At that time, their mind is straight, based on those deities. A noble disciple who is, whose mind is straight uh, finds inspiration in the meaning and inspiration in the teaching yeah, and finds joy connected with the teaching. Yeah. When the joyful rapture springs up, uh, when the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. Uh, when the body is tranquil, you feel bliss. Uh, and when you feel bliss, the mind becomes stilled. Uh, this is called the noble disciple who lives is in balance among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, they enter the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of the deities. Uh, so uh, here it is, it is quite a simple one. Yeah, yeah it, this really relies on having a feeling for these deities, these gods, uh, having a sense for who they are, uh, and. Um, the way to think about them almost is almost like you can almost think about them as if they are human. Yeah, their their body may be somewhat similar, probably similar to our body, but it is more light, it is more translucent, it is very kind of light coming out of it, it's radiant, yeah. And of course, in terms of their qualities of heart, they're gonna be often very pure beings. Yeah, they're gonna have a lot of these characters qualities that we're seeing here, the generosity and all of these kind of things. And they're very beautiful in the, both a mental sense, but also in the kind of the way you look at them, because their body 
will re the physical body will reflect the inequalities. Yeah? And then you ask yourself, yay, you know, I have the same qualities. You notice the qualities that are mentioned here is the confidence, yeah, the morality, learning. Learning is interesting. Yeah? It is the idea of having an understanding really of the Buddhist teaching, primarily, not any other learning so much, but learning about spiritual matters, generosity, and wisdom. Yeah, so this, these are the other qualities that are mentioned here. Wisdom, of course, being the highest one. So uh, uh, this is uh, just that feeling. And when you recall these beautiful beings, uh, and you know that you are on the same path, that you are, at the very least, uh, you know that you're heading for something wonderful. Uh, you have this feeling that life is moving in the right direction. Uh, even if you don't go beyond it, even if you don't reach awakening in this life, uh, at the very least, you will be, hopefully, be reborn in some very beautiful location because of your uh, qualities of your heart, uh, which is kind of nice, yeah? It's almost, it's interesting, you know, in Buddhism, we often talk about uh, the idea we shouldn't settle for anything less, you know, yeah, these gods, yeah, some of the people kind of sneer, yeah, rebirth among the gods, who wants that? Uh, but uh, the Buddha, this kind of reflection is almost the opposite. Yeah? It's almost glorifying the idea of being reborn among the gods. Uh, it should be seen as something positive, yeah? something heading in the right direction. It is not the final goal, but it certainly is nothing to be sneered at. It's not something to be looked down upon. Yeah? It is still a positive thing. It's a good consolation prize. Yeah? If you don't make it all the way, at least is to get something. Yeah. Might as well take the consolation prize if you can't get the full thing. Yeah. So let's, let's make do with the consolation prize yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you have no choice yeah, because you can't take it all the way. Yeah. So uh, then the very last line here, the Buddha says, when a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instructions, uh, this is the kind of meditation they frequently practice. Yeah. So I would uh, recommend you sometimes very gently to try some of these things. Yeah? And uh, if you try these things, then you become better at seeing your own good qualities and seeing the generosity you have done in the, the past. And, and someone was asking yesterday about low, low self-esteem. And this is one of the ways of overcoming also low self-esteem because you are building up some memories that are very positive. Uh, and you're going to start to feel very good about yourself if you do that in the right way. So try this out and see if this can give a little bit of a boost to your meditation practice. Because as we have seen, joy and happiness is absolutely fundamental to the path of meditation. So uh, let us stop there. And uh, because I think that is a suitable place to stop. And let us go for some questions. Are there any, anyone have any questions today? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm <laughs> sure they'll, they'll start coming in. <laughs> so we have one already. Uh, when I hear the Dhamma explained so clearly, the path is very clear. An area that I falter is in practicing meditation. My mind calms down fairly quickly. The breath almost disappears, but it doesn't follow on from there. Where am I going wrong? What can I do or not do? to progress to samadhi. Um, okay. Um, uh, first of all, be, be content with what you have already. Yeah? Enjoy what you have already. And don't always look for something more. Uh, I think the problem often is looking for something more. But that looking for something more may actually disturb the progress itself. But uh, what you probably need, if the, if the breath starts to disappear, it doesn't kind of develop any further. Well, it really is the thing we have been talking about now that you need to develop probably. Yeah? That ability to rejoice in something, rejoice in them, um, all the blessings in your life. And you're bound to have lots of blessings if you're practicing this path. Uh, so see if you can rejoice in that. Uh, you can bring up some wholesome feelings. Uh, uh, that come with that. And as soon as you start to feel a little bit of joy in meditation, that is what sharpens the mindfulness. It's very hard to not be mindful when you start to feel joy. Mindfulness gets really polished up. 
I think a large part of the problem is often that lack of joy makes the mindfulness a bit dull. Yeah, we don't have any because being present isn't all that great. Yeah, you'd rather go and I don't know, do something else. Uh, because the, the point is again to make the present moment a pleasant moment. Yeah, the more pleasant the present moment is, uh, the easier it is to have mindfulness there. So you just come back to some of these uh, uh, basic things. Uh, and if the recollection of these things is not that easy, <coughs> remember to do things that purifies the foundation of meditation practice. So, yeah, the foundations, again, we have seen it so many times now, the sila, the metta, the compassion, all of these things, our attitude to the world and, and, and what have you. Yeah, go back to that, go back to the basics. And uh, more important than doing meditation practice is to ensure that those basic practices are, are carried out to the highest possible um, degree. And then the meditation will start to come together. It is a, quite a demanding path, the Buddhist path, that really takes a lot. You have to really, really be committed. Uh, uh, and, and that is the hard part. You don't have to be intelligent to do this part. Yeah, the, the ideas are, are quite straightforward. Be kind. Well, everyone can be kind. But, but it takes commitment to really do it. And that is the hard part with the Buddhist path. So you just have to persevere with these things, and then you will find a way through that, uh, uh, those problems that you're having. Yeah. So the questions are pouring in now. <laughs> So someone's asking, on the one hand, I feel that renunciation and letting go is the way, but on the other hand, it seems so hard to do such an effort to reach Nibbana anywhere in maybe thousands of lives. As I'm physically very <laughs> isolated from people and Sangha, what can I do to motivate myself to remain on the path? Okay, well, that's, that's great that you are already, I mean, you're isolated, yeah. Um, if you're isolated from people, it's wonderful. It means that you have a very good location probably to practice, yeah. And uh, so what you have to do, remember renunciation is only difficult because of wrong view, yeah. So you, all you have to do is to reflect on this, uh, to think about this in the right way. And the noble ones, they know that there is no happiness in that sensory world. The sensory world is not interesting. Yet. They can give it up at any time. And this is why, if you have right view, any noble one who is truly noble will enter samadhi so easily because they can give up all the things that aren't suffering yet. So you just have to keep, remember those similes that we were talking about early on, the similes for the sensory world, yeah? Remember the drawbacks of the, remember how, Actually, unreliable it is. I mean, this is one of the great lessons of the COVID pandemic, is how unreliable that world is and, and uh, how and how stupid we often are as human beings, how we have known for decades that these pandemics will kind of come back. Yeah? And then we are so negligent as human beings, we don't really prepare ourselves. And then when the pandemic comes, we are kind of caught off guard. Yeah, this is this is the human. This is how we live in this human realm. Yeah, we're never really ready because when we when things go well and everyone is reasonably well off and happy, we become complacent. And when we are complacent, we forget that the same problems are going to arise again. This is the nature of the world. COVID 19s pandemics always recur in various forms. Climate change. Yeah, where is the world heading with climate change? You know, I, to me, it looks very serious, the whole climate change thing. I don't know what it looks to you, but to me, it looks really, really serious. So, so where are we going? Are we, is this the end of human civilization as we know it? What exactly is happening with climate change? And I, I don't mean to be a climate change alarmist, uh, nor, nor am I really all that interested in the politics of climate change, but what I'm interested in is the dumber consequences of this, the fact that we don't know, the fact that the world is out of control, the fact that we are there, our ability to do something with this is actually very limited. We are so, you know, we are so weak in the face of these enormous disasters happening around us that are, you know, there's billions of people who, who are part of this, very difficult to control these things. So what is going to happen? And that uncertainty is to me the most interesting thing because it means that that realm is so utterly unreliable and really so uninteresting. Yeah? 
It's like one problem after the other. And when we resolve one problem, another one is over the hill and we could continue resolving problems forever without ever finding any real solutions. We're not going anywhere in that realm. So try to turn away a little bit more from that world and realize the limitations of that world. Realize that there's always going to be another war. There's always going to be human conflict because precisely because we have to fight over resources and resources are limited. The cake is only so large. Everyone can only get a slice that is so big, etc. And then after a while, you get kind of fed up with all of that. You want to turn away from it because it is so unreliable. But your inner life, well, that is where we have some degree of control. It is hard enough to control them our inner life, yeah, because our thoughts are so conditioned. Uh, even when we try to control our thoughts, we often we can't do it. Uh, we have to develop them very slowly over time, but at least we have some control there. We can, sometimes we can decide uh, we want to act from kindness, we want to have the right intentions. So deal, deal with what is interesting, where you have an effect, uh, where you can do something, which is your inner life. Uh, that is the world where we can develop something. And uh, for that reason, that is why it is interesting. Yeah? The world outside cannot really be developed uh, because it is always going to be unstable, unreliable, uncertain. Uh, so don't try to develop the outer world. Don't try to develop an interest in the outer world. Uh, turn away from that. Turn inside instead. Uh, and then uh, the meditation will start to happen there. But, um, you know, also, Again, it often comes back to this idea, very simple ideas of kindness and ethics. Uh, and the very uh, important part of that is to develop more metta on the path and develop more compassion uh, uh, through that sutta that I read out uh, yesterday. Uh, yeah, with the, uh, uh, was it this, this morning? Yeah, I'm getting confused already. But uh, uh, the, uh, the sutta about the uh, anger and ill will, how to overcome that, yeah, and how. Uh, using these kind of things and then moving towards the greater degrees of metta. So the more pure your heart is, uh, the more kindness and care you have for the people in the world around you, the greater will be your ability in meditation. So these two things together, yeah, building up the kindness inside, which leads to joy and happiness, which reduces all these defilements we have, uh, that combined with the turning away from the world is a very powerful combination. If you can do those two things together, you have both the joy and the turning away from things, and then you're on the right track, I think. We've got about eight questions, all about devas, <laughs> which is interesting, but um, wow. I think I'll go, I'll go to a couple of meditation questions first. Um, yeah. Sure. So someone's asking, when I have difficulty meditating, I often find it incredibly easy and enjoyable to use our beautiful pet dog as an object of meditation. I'm assuming that this is bad practice, but I'm hoping you could tell me otherwise. What about using a neutral, cute animal that I have no real life connection with? I think I heard about this from Ajahn Sajato to help develop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, you know, um, I, I, I think either one of those is okay. Just look at the feelings that arise. I mean, it, ideally, you don't want to have too much attachment involved with the meta because it uh, stains the meta, it taints the meta a little bit. Yeah, if there's attachment there, you don't really want to try to have. I mean, you want to be kind to your partner in life, but to practice meta towards the, your partner is going to be by definition, going to be a bit tainted. So I, it might be, you might be better off using a neutral animal, but an animal, your attachment to an animal is probably, I don't know, I, if it's going to be that stronger. Um, I really, it's very hard for me to, to say, but try it out, yeah? Whatever works, whatever gives rise to good feelings really here. Yeah? And then you have to check out in your own mind whether it is tainted by attachments or not, or whether it is more like a, a distant kind of cool meta where you're not really holding on to much. And then you can try, as you say, on a neutral animal. And if that works, maybe even better, yeah, because you have more of a kind of uh, a bit more distance, a bit more mindfulness about what's going on, perhaps. So, so just check it out, try it out, yeah, and then see what uh, how, what happens. Uh, Adam Brahm always talks about having meta to animals. Yeah, he typically he, he would use a kitten. 
a little kitten to, uh, you know, for, for his mental practice or compassion practice or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, that would be like a made up kitten, a kitten of the imagination. And uh, that would be good enough. Thank you. Dear Ajahn, thanks to yours and Venerable Chandal's valuable teachings, I feel my mind is less murky and agitated. But now I can't help labeling the thoughts as they appear in my mind. For example, wanting, ill will, past, future, etc. It's presenting me from following the breath completely. Please advise. Hmm. Yeah, I, it's just a, a habit from the past that you're carrying with you. Uh, you probably have done some noting meditation in the past, perhaps. Maybe that's the, probably the reason why this is happening. Yeah. So, so uh, just allow the noting to be there. Yeah, don't worry about the noting. Just, just don't focus on it. Don't make it any worse. Uh, be with the breath. Uh, at the same time, allow the kind of the noting to be in the background. And as you allow it to be in the background, you don't give it any importance. Uh, eventually, it will just fade away and it will just, just be gone. Uh, and uh, then you won't have that uh, have that there anymore. Huh? So uh, I've heard this from many other meditators as well, how the noting kind of takes on a life of its own and it kind of takes over your mind and, and you are incapable of staying with the meditation object itself. It's kind of a common thing. Yeah? And um, so I think that I, you know, so uh, if you really want to become peaceful and you really want to take the meditation deeply at some point, you do have to stop the noting. And uh, personally, I don't think it is necessary. In fact, there is no indication that I have seen that this is uh, was ever suggested by the Buddha, the other idea of noting. And I know that there have been some suggestions that it comes from the suttas, but uh, I think those suggestions have been very weak and not really very persuasive. So just uh, allow the noting to be there. Don't worry about it. Don't try to push it away. Just kind of come to accept it. Uh, and the guarantee it will fade away over time. Bente, you've spoken about giving gentle nudges to the mind in meditation, but what about the body? Should we relax muscle tension or leave it alone? Um, uh, yes, I think it's a good idea, especially at the beginning of the meditation when you start out, to make sure that you are really relaxed. Uh, very often, if you have tense muscles, very often it says something about your mind, yeah, because uh, when the mind is tense, the body becomes tense. And if your mind is really relaxed, uh, then normally your body is also relaxed. Uh, so by letting go or uh, relaxing the body, then very often you're also relaxing the mind. The mind is becoming more peaceful, less agitated, and more, uh, uh, more wholesome, basically, the qualities of the mind. So uh, as the meditation uh, progresses, if you start to feel tense, uh, it can be that you are fo focusing too hard on the breath, uh, yeah, using too much willpower again, uh, forcing your attention on your meditation object, and that can then have an effect on the body. And that can be quite useful information, yeah, because then it tells us now I'm using too much willpower. I really need to, uh, I need to let go a little bit. Uh, so then what you do, let go of the breath. Don't worry about the breath at all. Allow yourself to find a more balanced, you know, you just relax again. Go back to a little bit more to the beginning. You relax, let go of what's happening. Have a bit of kindness and compassion for yourself and feel more at ease and then build up the mindfulness and then come back to the breath when the mindfulness is reestablished and you are at ease again. So... Yeah, so be, be wise about this. Remember the, remember the basic things, yeah? Come back to the basic things again and again. Uh, and uh, the meditation should always be pleasant. Uh, when the body starts to become tense, uh, you know that it is becoming less pleasant, and it, that is always a warning sign that you might be heading down the wrong track. Yeah? Okay, another one about the body in meditation. So first they're saying that uh, yesterday's meditation on death was unexpected, really smooth and peaceful. Thank you. I was wondering if the Buddha mentioned anything about meditation posture in the suttas. I prefer to sit on the floor cross-legged, but after many days of sitting this way for hours, my knees have started to hurt. So I tried to change my posture, but then the meditation doesn't progress that deep so easily. Apart from comfort, I was wondering if there is an effect of the posture on the meditation or if it's just in my mind and how to overcome this. 
<coughs> I think the Buddha normally recommends the cross-legged posture, yeah, sitting down on the floor, crossing your legs. And we will see that tomorrow when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta, because it starts off with that, sitting down, cross-legged, uh, having a straight body, that's how it begins. Uh, and um, it, it is hard, though, to know to what extent this is a cultural thing or whether it is a, a requirement. And I tend to think of it more as a cultural thing because I know a lot of people who uh, get good meditation in all kinds of postures. Uh, yeah, uh, Some people get really good meditation while walking, for goodness sake. Yeah? And they get good meditation when they lie down. They get good meditation when they sit on a chair. Yeah. So the, it is really, the, it is a mental discipline, meditation. It's an ability to just let go and let be. Yeah? Yeah? So it should, the posture should not really matter so much as long as you are sitting in a good way. The body is largely self-sustaining. Yeah? The body sits there and uh, it kind of sustains itself. You don't have to kind of force anything. Yeah? So you... Um, uh, I think the point about the posture with cross-legged is that it is a very stable posture. You tend to feel quite, uh, you feel very kind of solid when you sit in that posture. And that is the ideal. So try to bring that sense of solidity into any other posture you have. And then the posture should not matter all that much. But uh, yes, it can be a psychological block because we feel that, you know, we should be sitting cross-legged. And when you don't do that, and the mind thinks, oh, I'm not really meditating now. And because of that, you, it's harder to kind of get into the feeling, the mood of meditation. But uh, try to, you know, don't um, buy into that. Just remind yourself that some very good meditators around the world actually do sit on chairs, do lie down on their back, they do walk in meditation. Yeah? And they get really, really good results from that. Uh, so it's a little bit about reconditioning yourself. Uh, and trying to sit uh, in other ways, yeah, so that you can uh, uh, you can enjoy the meditation again. I think pain is a really for most people it is a very distracting thing, and so it is really worthwhile trying to uh, uh, trying to learn to use other meditation postures. So. Okay. Another meditation question: In samadhi meditation, watching the breath, how do you gain insights? What exactly does this mean? In other words, is it insight into the three characteristics, four noble truths, karma and past lives, or what? Um, do you get these insights during the meditation or after the meditation upon reflection, please? So how do you gain uh, insights and when? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's actually come, all coming up tomorrow because tomorrow we're going to look at the Anapanasati Sutta. And that Sutta has uh, 16 steps. And of those 16 steps, the first 12 are really about how to calm the mind. And the last four, they are about the, the insights that come from that. And um, so generally speaking, the insights tend to come afterwards, yeah? after you come out of your meditation, because if you are fully focused on your meditation object, that there isn't really room for insights to arise. But sometimes you may not be 100% focused, in which case maybe uh, there is room to, for something to arise. So it's not, it's not absolute, these are just general principles. So uh, the more focused you are, the less room there is for insights to arise. So, but when you come out after the meditation, yeah, and you reflect back on the process that you have been through, uh, that reflection is a understanding of three characteristics so, and specifically, what you are looking at is the five kandhas, yeah, because it is the five kandhas that we have with us when we meditate. When you watch the breath, when you do any kind of meditation, the experience you have is an experience of the five kandhas, the five uh, personality factors. Yeah, that's what you actually experience. People sometimes find the five kandhas, the five factors of personality, mysterious. But actually, it's not mysterious at all. It's what you are experiencing right now is that is those five kandhas. And so you look back upon your experience in meditation, and then you will see that things are ending, they are impermanent, yeah. Things are fading away. And as they fade away, you understand that they are dukkha because you feel better when they fade away. You understand that they are non-self because 
you, you, they are gone, yeah, they are completely gone, and you are still there, so there must be no self, and then you gain insight, and that is the ideal way of gaining insight. And this is a traditional way in the Buddhist suttas to gain insight, the basic insight of the three characteristics. The insights that have to do with rebirth and karma, they are of a slightly different uh, uh, type, and they are even deeper insights, yeah, these are even, in some ways, even depends what you mean by deep and depends on that but um, and it depends on how preliminary those other insights I shouldn't say they're deep but that was just of a different kind I suppose uh, but uh, that happens also after very deep samadhi you become a samadhi and then you guide your mind in the right way you ask yourself what is your first memory and then you take it beyond that uh, and then you go back in time until yeah you may uh, recall your past lives so. So that's more like a, a direction, uh, direct, directing the mind in the right way. And uh, in the sutta, it says that you can direct your mind to all kinds of fun things. Yeah? You can direct it to uh, supernormal powers, to uh, reading people's minds. I probably wouldn't recommend that because there's a lot of rubbish in people's minds. You, you'd be very disappointed probably if you'd be able to read people's minds. And uh, to all of these kinds of things that are supposedly possible yeah, on the Buddhist path. Uh, and uh, but uh, yeah anyway enough about that yeah. yeah someone's asking why can't we remember our past lives i find it difficult to believe in the existence of past lives because i don't feel like i've been through any of this before <laughs> okay um so what was the first one how can we believe in it was that what um why can't we remember our past lives well, why, why, okay, sorry, right, okay. Why? Well, uh, I think it has to do with the uh, trauma of rebirth. Yeah, when you get reborn, especially into a human existence, uh, it actually is quite traumatic. And I think that may be part of the message of the first noble truth, where it starts off by saying, rebirth is dukkha, jati pidukkha. Yeah, rebirth is suffering. It is quite a traumatic and difficult experience. You can imagine they often say that the um, idea of a near-death experience when you are released from your body, they say it is very pleasant because you get out of this heavy body, especially if this heavy body is sick on top of uh, uh, the other ordinary problems. Uh, it is actually very pleasant to get out of your body. Uh, and then when you get out of your body, and someone that you have to go back into it again, uh, not only do you have to get back into a body, but it's this tiny little thing, yeah, this little tiny little fetus or whatever it is, uh, and there is no, there's no brain there, nothing is developed. You just have to inhabit this lump of, little lump of meat, which is kind of barely, you know, barely able to function in any, any ordinary way. It's probably quite traumatic and quite difficult to, to deal, deal with that. And that process seems to erase your ability to remember the past lines. So, and this is the difference between the Deva realm if you look at the gods, the gods will normally remember their past lives because in the god realms you re-arise spontaneously you don't have to go through a traumatic rebirth experience so those gods they will actually remember oh yeah i was a human being before i was practicing like this i was doing that and now i've been really born here so they have that clarity in a sense so i think that is a, a part of the part of the answer yeah and and why it is uh, why it is so hard but even in the human realm uh, sometimes people have recollections uh, yeah of these things uh, there are so many stories of you hear about children who supposedly remember their past lives uh, why shouldn't that be the case uh, yeah sometimes people children get reborn they have that recollection with them uh, uh, it might very well be true there is some quite powerful evidence for that uh, uh, people being reborn with very strange birth defects and those birth defects um, matching with the memory that they had in from a past life, yeah, which turns out to be real. Such a person actually didn't exist. And sometimes it is beyond coincidence that these things could, could have happened because there are such incredibly rare events that they're talking about. So uh, there is uh, some interesting uh, uh, research being done in those uh, those areas that is basically why so don't force yourself to believe in rebirth because that is also counterproductive just consider it uh, think about the evidence uh, look at uh, 
uh, with various possibilities. There, there is research happening in these areas all the time, and the world is always changing. The way we think about the world is always changing. And uh, so now, you know, for that possibility at least, and then keep on contemplating it and see where that leads you. Okay, there's a couple more questions that are not about Davis, and then we've got lots and lots of Deva questions. So, <laughs> um, how is it possible that the monks or nuns were able to memorize the Buddha's exact words for many centuries without written evidence? Um, the reason that was possible was because the ancient India it had what we might call a technology of memory, or memorization, I should say. Uh, remember in India, they had the Vedas. The Vedas were the ancient scripture of the Brahmanical caste. Yeah? And these went back maybe a thousand, maybe 1500 years before the Buddha, at least. And it is well known that those Vedas, and this is known through research, that those Vedas were memorized almost per day by those Brahmins. Uh, and the way they did that was using Brahmanical techniques. Uh, Techniques like memorizing them in forward order, in reverse order, techniques like it, having numerical lists of things and uh, using words in, in certain ways. There was all these techniques that were employed by these Brahmins. So they had a technology, you'd say, of memorization that was part of Indian society. So when the Buddha comes along, he would take some of those techniques and use them uh, for and structuring suttas in such a way as to make them easy to remember. He would use countable lists, yeah, lists of five or this, six or that, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. He would have suttas which had a kind of frame, they had an introduction and an ending, and then a main body of the text in between. So they had a kind of a, a container, if you like, that contained them and make it easy to uh, memorize something as a complete whole. He would use lists of synonyms yeah when you have a list of synonyms uh, it's easy for the text to uh, be stable because the synonyms will stabilize the words in that text uh, it would use a lot of repetition so the same line will occur again and again and again and you have seen some of that today yeah, and also in the previous days and one word will change so the texts are in many cases optimized for memorization yeah this is kind of a, how they were given at that time because of course the buddha knew that his texts were going to be memorized in the future and then as you rightly say they were memorized for a few centuries the uh, pali texts are generally regarded to have been written down about 60 bc the year 60 bc or, or uh, uh, bce i should say uh, that probably was already some texts written down before that but systematically that seems to have been when they were systematically written down there. so then probably if we assume that the buddha passed away around the year 400 bce there would have been maybe a 300 year period in which the texts were recited so how can we know for sure that they were accurately accurately recited and the evidence is that uh, these texts, they started to disperse in India around the time of Ashoka. Ashoka lived about 150 years after the Buddha. So that was still in the oral period when these things were transmitted orally. Yeah? Then, the, then the text started to disperse. Ashoka was famous for sending missionaries around the world. Some were sent to Sri Lanka, some were sent to the north of India, to Kashmir and Gandhara, and from Kashmir and Gandhara. They went into Central Asia onto the Silk Road and followed the Silk Road with the merchants. They went all the way to India and they started to arrive in India uh, around the year zero, just before the year zero, the, the first text would arrive in India and then gradually develop from that. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, these texts, you compare them today, they are still very, very similar. Uh, and uh, part of that period in which they have been a part is part of that period, is the oral period. Uh, yeah? So because that is part of the oral period, they separated while they were still in the oral transmission period. By comparing now, we can know that that oral transmission actually was very accurate. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be possible that they still were so similar. And one of the interesting things about those people who study these things in detail is the fact that some of the errors that sometimes do occur in transmission you can do that by again by comparing these texts 
they are the kind of errors uh, that you would expect when texts are orally recited. Yeah, they have the hallmarks uh, of oral recitation. Uh, uh, like, um, like what? Um, there are certain things that kind of typically occur. Okay, it doesn't come to mind now. I'm getting a little bit tired. I can't really, I can't uh, kind of, it doesn't come quite easily to mind. But anyway, they, they have the hallmarks of uh, being oral recitations. And uh, so we, uh, so we know that those texts, they started to separate in the oral period and they have been preserved, still been preserved almost uh, very, very close to the original. Okay, okay easy one now. And dear Ajahn, can the eight precepts also be helpful to develop the basis for mindfulness in daily life? It seems that some degree of restraint gives more energy to the mind rather than doing or consuming whatever the mind wants that seems to lead to more dullness. Uh, yes, yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, if we indulge too much in the sensory world, then it leads to dullness, it leads to you know, yeah, that's that's a good point. So some degree of restraint can be useful. Um, whether you want to go down the track of eight precepts, that really depends on your situation. Yeah, on your how far you can take these precepts. I would, you know, if you have a demanding life that demands you to work hard or whatever, then it usually is probably going to be able to have a meal in the afternoon, for example. Yeah, I don't think that is going to stop you. You have to be reasonable about this. You have to know what actually functions for you, what you are able to do well, uh, within your ordinary life. Uh, in terms of the other precepts, sure, yeah, you know, reducing entertainment, etc., is probably not a bad idea. Um, whether you have to abandon it completely, well, that is uh, again up to you, but uh, you know, reducing it and sleeping on a fairly simple bed, probably not a bad idea also. So just be, um, be wise about it and be reasonable about it. And the more you can do it, the better. But I think sometimes we focus too much perhaps on the restraint side of things. I think more important than uh, even restraining it, uh, uh, is the idea of living with kindness, yeah? Because when you live with kindness, you're actually brightening up the mind. Uh, but if, if what you do is just restrain, then uh, sometimes that can, uh, unless the mind is ready, uh, it can uh, lead the mind to become a little hard or, or lacking, lacking in joy because there is no joy in the world. But if you have developed the other faculties of kindness, etc., so you already have some other joy and happiness in your life, then restraint is more practical and more possible and will give better results. So, so make sure you balance these things, yeah? Restraint on the one hand, and then the happy emotions on the other hand. So you don't kind of uh, become one of the dry Buddhists, yeah? Who has no joy and no happiness and, and life is just utterly miserable. And then you make zero progress on the path as a consequence. So you get the right balance with these things. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there's one more non-deva question <laughs> so you mentioned along the way that regarding various dilemmas or conundrums in the world the teachings can be quite flexible and adaptable in tackling such things which is not necessarily always the case for other traditions i wonder if you might briefly comment further on this aspect um uh, various conundrums and problems in the world and the teachings can be adapted to that then. Yeah, I, I, so the flexibility of Buddhism yeah. in particular compared to other traditions. Okay. Well, one, one of the flexibilities in Buddhism, which I find very powerful, is the, is the moral ideas of the morality of Buddhism. Yeah? Uh, the most ethical systems or moral systems are based on laws yeah you're given the ten commandments yeah? classic ten commandments God says keep this don't question it and do do exactly this and uh, most religious moral systems are based on a kind of a fixed set of moral precepts like that and in buddhism too of course we have the five precepts we have the eight precepts but what underlies that in Buddhism, is the idea that action which comes from defilements, yeah, that is the kind of final analysis of morality in Buddhism, is that the action that comes from defilement, 
that is bad, that is bad consequence, that is immoral. But action motivated by good qualities inside, that is, that is always going to be good. So the five precepts are just an approximation, yeah, a very useful approximation because it guides you in ordinary life, but, but still just an approximation to morality. But, uh, you know, if you are going to really look at this more carefully, you could argue that there are probably situations where it might look like you're doing something immoral from the external point of view, but you're actually acting from purity. Uh, think of things like voluntary assisted dying, for example. Uh, yeah, is it wrong to assist someone to die? Well, it really depends on where you're coming from. If you're coming from compassion, you know the person wants to die, and you are you are sure that they are do, you are doing the right thing. Well, it probably, it, it, yeah. If you're coming from good qualities, it might even be good. You might actually be doing something positive, right? or even things like lying. Yeah, is lying always bad? Well, again, it really depends. It's a whole spectrum of lying. There's lying that is really, really bad. When you lie for personal gain, or you lie because you don't like someone, you're coming from anger, of course, it is really, really bad. But let's say that you lie out of compassion. Yeah, let's say that, uh, um, you know, the, the classic example that Ajahn Brahm always gives is this, uh, this lady who was, who had a, a husband who was sick with heart disease and he was lying in hospital. You may have probably heard this story many times with some of you before. And then he was lying in hospital and he was sharing a room with another man and then the other man was wheeled into the operation room first and he died yeah, on the operation table. And then the wife comes of this man who is still there and, and, and uh, he asks his wife, well, what happened to my, my friend who went into the operation yesterday or whatever? And then his wife sort of knows that if she tells him yeah, the truth about what happened, uh, he is likely to become pretty anxious, yeah? <laughs> it's obvious if someone has just died. Uh, so she says, oh, yeah, never mind, he's, he's all right, uh, yeah? And, and maybe he was okay, maybe he died and he went to a good realm. I don't know, maybe you could kind of make it so that's not lying, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but, uh, and that was a case where probably she was coming from, mostly from compassion, yeah? And she knew that telling the truth in that situation would be actually, that might be uncompassionate because it might, you know, maybe she hated her, and, yeah, this is my chance to get rid of it, yeah? Yeah, your friend, he died, yeah? <laughs> and then, <laughs> you can imagine if you do that, yeah? And the result that would have on the husband. So maybe if you wanted him to die, that would have been the time to tell the truth. So you can see sometimes the truth can be used in a way that is immoral. And lying can actually be the moral choice in certain cases. So it is not, these things are not black and white. In the final analysis, it depends on your motivation and why you are doing things. Uh, this is what I mean by the flexibility of the, uh, the, Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist teachings. Uh, they're not as rigid as some other systems can be sometimes. Uh, very flexible and adaptable to um, modern situations and ethical dilemmas. Uh, I think I had something else in mind as well when I said that, I seem to recall that, but um, I can't remember that. Please, if there was something else, please remind me again tomorrow or something. Maybe we can talk about it then. Okay. Great. So now for the Deva questions. Can you do merits if you're born as a Deva, or will your good merits finish and you'll fall to a lower realm? Uh, yeah, you can still make merits as a Deva. You can still be kind. Yeah, you can still live well because uh, the situation in the Deva is very similar to the human realm depending on high, how high up you are in the Deva Loka, of course. Uh, if you're very high, you can't really do much merit because you are kind of stuck in the jhana state. Uh, but the more lovely they are very much like us, uh, glorified human beings, uh, yeah? And uh, you can be kind or you can be nasty. You can have peace or you can have war, or you can have metta or you can have ill will, uh, just like here. So yes, you can make merit. Uh, and um, uh, then that also have an effect on your rebirth. So, um, yeah, so no need to be too afraid of the Devaloka, uh, and especially if you are this and you get reborn in the Devaloka, you get reborn in the Buddhist corner of the Devaloka. <laughs> Hang out with all the Buddhists when you go out there. And they will then tell you, yay, welcome to the Buddhist corner of the Devaloka. <laughs> <laughs> Recite the teachings for you. 
and then you will remember the teachings yeah as you heard them as a human being and everything will come back to you and this is actually pretty much how it is explained in the suttas it may sound like i'm making it up but no it is actually there are suttas that say pretty much just that yeah. okay my question is what defilements does a deity have that means they've been reborn in that realm They have defilements, the same defilements that we have, but just a bit more subtle. Yeah. So in the lo lower devalokas, they are quite similar to human beings. They're not that different. Yeah. You read in the suttas about all the things they get up to in the devaloka, and you realize that they're not that different from humans. They have a little bit less defilement. Their minds are a little bit more pure than the average human being. Yeah. They have a bit more good qualities, but they're not that different. But as you go up the kind of ladder of rebirth, the higher you go, the more pure they are, the less defilements they have. And as you approach the jhana realms of rebirth, the mind are going to have very, very subtle defilements remaining in them. You have very little there, and you're going to have very pure beings at that particular point. But uh, essentially, they are, uh, they are like us. I think one of the main qualities that they will have less of in the day is anger yeah ill will and anger is one of the main things that lead to a rebirth in the lower realm if you have a lot of ill will and anger then, then you you know you um, have to be careful of what you do and how you live your life uh, but uh, in the lower devaloka, they have a lot of sensual pleasures and yeah, they're still enjoying the sensual realms uh, so that defilement is still quite strong as you go high, that one too is uh, reduced. And uh, as for the delusion, uh, the devas are probably likely to have fairly clear minds, uh, but the deep delusion, the deep delusions of an I am and the self is there for all devas, all the way up to the very highest deva realm. So, so that kind of delusion is still going to be part of, the, uh, part of these uh, beings. Uh, and dear Ajahn, in recollection of the devas, there's mention of the gods who control the creation of others. Isn't Mara one of those? Does it mean that Mara also has qualities that may be worth recollecting? <laughs> I'm sure Mara would be able to hear that, yeah. <laughs> Mara would be <laughs> choice. When we Mara, we traps us in Saksara even more. So, Yes, I think Mara, obviously Mara is actually a very different deity, yeah? Otherwise Mara wouldn't have been reborn in that high realm. So Mara has very many quali uh, good qualities, especially when he's reborn in that realm. But Mara does use his or her existence, or, or its existence, whatever it is, to very, very well, yeah? If she or it or he or whatever, what's the opportunity now? And they end up trying to control other beings and probably create a lot of bad karma as a consequence. And you find that in the suttas, yeah, that's found in the sutta in the Tajmanikaro, the Mara Tajaniya Sutta, the rebuke to Mara, where Mara is said to do all kinds of bad things, even to the noble, noble monastics. They're trying to kind of control the samsara and all of these kind of things. So uh, this, this is one of those things about the heavenly realms. They are a bit of a mixed bag. All of them have beings that are really in a deep way. And other ones, they have, they have had the goods in the past to be reborn there. But they also have some dark side to their personality, which comes out through power trips and these kind of things. But um, please remember Mara in the suttas, even though Mara is a kind of talk time as a deity in certain places. The main meaning of Mara is really psychological. Mara is the tempter inside each one of us that wants us, yeah, that always leads us astray, that tells us, like, yeah, it doesn't matter if you indulge in this a little bit, yeah, now is the time to get angry and that clearly they deserve it. That is the voice of Mara every time, yeah. Mara tells you, you to quit being a monastic because, yeah, I'm not sure if this works anyway, or, or whatever it is. That is the real voice of Mara. It's a psychological state. And that is the one that is, uh, to my, I, I checked this once, I counted the usage of Mara in the suttas, and there was a clearly predominant usage is the idea of a Mara as a psychological condition, psychological 
and tempter in a sense. Okay. Do the gods have bodies made of materials similar to us? Do they need solid food like us? <laughs> uh, yes, they have material bodies. Uh, the uh, Pali word for material here is rupa. Yeah, and uh, the rupa comes in many kind of consistencies. There is a human rupa that is very solid yeah, and very kind of quite coarse. And the data bodies are, are more refined. It's a more refined version of material phenomena. It's like when you die, yeah, and it's uh, you kind of you extract your body from the present body, and a more refined material body emerges. In the suttas, they use the simile of the uh, uh, sheaf of reed or, or straw, where you pull one straw out of the, the other one, yeah. And uh, so it's the same kind of body that comes out of this body, except that it is more refined. And that's why when you have an outer body experience, you are actually there and you have a, you still have a body, but it's kind of more refined than the previous one. So the physical body comes in many degrees of refinement. And yes, you will still be requiring nourishment of some kind to sustain that. Uh, and uh, so in Devadoka, they will also eat, they will have ambrosia, yeah, <laughs> that's what they have in the heavenly realms, and they will just uh, enjoy that kind of divine food, I suppose. Um, so yes, the answer is yes in short term. Okay. Regarding devas, should we pay some respect towards the devas in a way that's supportive of our practice? I've noticed how in Thai culture, for example, people are very aware of the presence of devatas all around. Thank you. Um, yes, maybe. I, I mean, there the, the are examples in the suttas of the devas kind of guarding people. You know, one of the interesting things is that almost all cultures in the world have this idea of guardian, guardian gods or guardian angels. Western culture has the idea of guardian angels. In Asian culture, it's more like guardian gods, but same basic principle, yeah. So, uh, I think it is quite likely that, uh, in the suit, as you find this, uh, quite likely that there are gods who will be there sometimes, yeah? But that, that does not depend so much on whether you give them a gift or not, because that's, they, they, I'm not sure how much they care about that. I'm not sure how much they can use of a human gift anyway. To the gods, is probably pretty low what we can give them. They're enjoying much more refined things. Uh, but it has more to do with our conduct, yeah? So if we are good, beings, if we are, if we live our life well, so that we have the potential of re being reborn in the Deva Loka, that is when the gods may look out for us. Yeah? They may look out for the goodness in people's hearts. So if you want to be looked after by the gods, the best thing to do is to live well. Then. And then they might, might look after you. But the, the gods are just like human beings. They are fickle. Yeah? They, they might look after you one moment and they might forget about you because they go playing in their in the day of my garden and messing around and then oops we forgot about it. that human being who was in trouble or whatever so it is nothing really to rely on because the gods are not reliable in the same way as the dhamma is reliable yeah maybe they're going to be there maybe not who knows so it's not really it's not really a buddhist practice to <coughs> to ask the gods for support or to you know put out food for the gods or anything like that and uh, there are a few instances in the suttas, and I suspect that that is a corruption coming from the Indian culture, those kind of few instances. I haven't proven that, and I could be wrong, but it's my suspicion of those very few areas. And, uh, giving to the departed, however, giving to the ghosts, giving to our departed family members, that is more of a Buddhist place, which actually has more foundation in the suttas. So giving to the gods is much more uh, marginal than that you find there. So I would say, I would say it is not really worth it. And if you want to be protected by the gods, focus instead on just living well. That's the best way. Okay. Um, so there's about three more questions, Adjan. How are you doing for energy or? Uh, we, we just, let's do that. Let's go for it. Okay, yeah. lovely. So if we're reborn in the Deva realms, won't it just delay having to come back and do the work as a human? Or is there benefit in, the, in that the mind has a chance to really deepen good qualities that will influence the mental state in the human life? 
Um, there is uh, quite a few indications that you can track this in the Deva Loka. The indication that you can even become a three member in the Deva Loka. Yeah. So it is not that you have to do the practice in the human realm. You can uh, you can carry it on in the Deva Loka, at least to some extent. You know, one of the famous people who became a screen with it was Saka, the lord of the, uh, the gods of the 33, who came down and visited the Buddha. It's all explained in the Saka Panya Sutta, the long before the 21st Sutta. And then it tells the story of how Saka became a screen and about interviewing the Buddha, and then obviously gained the insight into these things. <coughs> so the Devaloka is not as barren of Dhamma as you might think. It, in fact, if you think about it, through two and a half thousand years of Buddhist history, where will the most of the noble people have been reborn? Well, they will have been reborn in higher realm because of their good qualities. So when you get reborn in the Deva Loka, you may find more areas there than you find in the human realm. Yeah, hanging out, you have better friends, more chance to hear the Dhamma, perhaps. So in some ways, the Deva Loka may actually turn out to be great places to be yeah, and, and really positive places to be. And then if you do come back as a human being, as you say, you may actually come back and have even a better chance of, uh, uh, of practicing in the right way if you have been doing the right thing in heaven. So I think, uh, I don't think there is a first, I don't think there's a big problem with being reborn in the heavenly realm. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, back to meditation. So in deeper meditation, which candles drop away in which jhana stage? Is this how after you come out, you can have insight on how they are impermanent? Yes, that's exactly right. So the, the candles will uh, drop away gradually and fade away gradually. And uh, there will be parts of the candles missing. So you can have partial insight into the candles. And, and from that partial insight, we can then extrapolate and get the full insight. Of, yeah. So, for example, the, uh, the will will have completely disappeared in the uh, second jhana. That will be completely common. Uh, all painful feelings will have disappeared in the first jhana. Perceptions of the sensual realm will have disappeared in the first jhana. Um, uh, the physical body uh, uh, will have disappeared already in the first jhana, but the more refined aspects of rupa according to the way the suit does work, they disappear completely when you come to the immaterial attainment. There's are some very refined elements left until that point. There is this gradual, precisely this gradual abandoning, and then you will be able to see through insight uh, that abandoning, that's where insight can happen. Uh, but we'll get back to this tomorrow when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta. Okay, so last one. As a layperson, is dana a good motivation to own and manage a business with the idea to give away the profits? If you still own and the business and manage it so that it, oh, sorry, you still own the business and manage it, so it's still a burden on the other hand. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, I'll say that again. You still uh, own the business and manage it, so it's still a burden. On the other hand, every year there's profit to be given away to help others. Or would you rather sell the business, have a simpler life, and distribute the money of the sale once and live a simpler life? <laughs> um, I, you know, these things, there isn't any right or wrong. One is going to be right and the other one is going to be wrong or the other way around. It's just a matter of how you want to live your life. Yeah, do you want, would you like to operate a business? There's nothing wrong with having a business. Yeah, it's great. You can support employees. You can, uh, you know, do something positive for the world. As you say, you can uh, give some of the profit. There's lots of benefits of having, having a business. So if you enjoy that and it enriches your life and you feel that it doesn't take away too much from your Dharma practice, then, then you can. Sometimes we have this ideal that we want to give up our business. So, so we can focus more on the Dhamma, but then when it comes down to it, then you're not able to practice the Dhamma to that degree. Yeah? It really depends on your development of the path. It depends on so many factors of what actually works there. Yeah? So you have to know that for yourself, that what is uh, going to work in your life. Yeah? Don't take hasty decisions. So. But if your meditation is going really well, you are really enjoying what you are doing, and, um, 
And uh, you know, you, you really think that giving up your business is going to be a great benefit in this field, so right? And maybe it is the right thing to do on it. Maybe then you have the opportunity to develop much further, yeah. And um, whatever money that you make for the sale of your business, you don't have to give it all away in one go. Yeah, you can give it away slowly as well, <laughs> or you can, uh, you know, depending on whether there is a good cause or whatever. So again, all of this is very imponderable. Sometimes you have to test the waters a little bit. Yeah, give up your business for a few months, have someone else run it and see how that feels. See if you're able to practice a spiritual life better in that case. So uh, try things out, yeah, and test, and uh, then you will find the right balance, hopefully, somewhere. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Can we finish with one nice little feedback? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ajahn Bramali's teachings are so clear and inspiring. I am enjoying the present retreat more than the previous one in Derbyshire. I hope I'll be fortunate enough to participate in similar retreats with Ajahn Pramali. <laughs> hey, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you all for the very kind feedback. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Vinod Chanda, for doing all the hard work. You know, doing a little bit of hard work and you're doing a lot of the hard work. So that's, that's my, <laughs> my privilege. <laughs> thank you, Ajahn. And uh, thank you so much. See you again tomorrow. Yeah. Great.